All right, here we are back again with another tote. Uh, this is tote number seven from the Phillips and Ford buyout from July of 2021. Um, and then once again, just like the others, I pulled a tote at random off the pile, a uh, big stack of them in the, in the garage that I have. And uh, I've taken the top off and we're just gonna get right into it here. This is, we've got a, piece of replacement glass. Uh, looks like a, it says brome on it. I'm not sure the part number. Um, Carlite. Carlite has their own part numbers. Um, I don't know what this is. It's curved. Uh, I'll have to look this up. This is going to take some. It's a, I mean, it's a quarter quarter window, obviously, or a, you know, a, a one of those little windows in the in the back quarter. Um, but I'll have no idea what it goes to, so I have to look it up. And my guess is it's probably some '70s thing. It's not worth much, but yeah, well, you know, it'll be interesting looking it up anyway. Um, oh, here we go. <clears throat> that is a replacement piston and it is a 60 thousandths oversize um, okay right off the bat uh, okay um, it's got a different part number on the box several different part numbers on the box this one written up on the top here is is right I think 40-6110-H now if it's if it said, if it said 40 40 this the, the 6110 is the part number for the bare piston Normally they sell these, if they would sell the pin and the retainers with it, it would be a 6108. And that's the piston assembly, but this is just the bare piston. Uh, a lot of people confuse those two numbers, but you have to be very specific because if somebody buys a 6108, they're expecting to get the pin and the retainer with it. But this, um, <clears throat> this is interesting because this 60 thousandths oversize, um, this is for the 221 flathead which they made from 1932 to 1941 um, it was replaced um, in 1941 by the 226 cubic inch flathead 6 uh, also known as the G series or the G engine um, it's the precursor to the to the straight sixes that everybody knows from the 60s um, but Whenever I get parts from them, I basically just throw them away because nobody builds G engines. Um, can't give them away. But anyway, um, that was also the same horsepower, 90 horsepower. But this is a 60 thousandths oversize, which which um, kind of brings me to an interesting subject about the flathead. Is a 60 thousandths oversize was really about the biggest they could get um, oversized bore because. The thing about the flathead, now the flathead was, <clears throat> it was revolutionary when it was introduced in 1932, not because of the concept of putting a multi-cylinder multi engine, and when I say multi-cylinder, I say more than four cylinders, um, a, a powerful multi-cylinder engine in a car, that had been done, I mean, but it was, you know, you had straight eights and V8s and V16s and all these prior to that, but those were all in the realm of the luxury cars. So Lincolns, Cadillacs, Pierce Arrows, that sort of thing. They all had the big displacement, powerful V motors and straight straight motors, straight eight motors and stuff in them. This was really the first time that a V8 or you know, a more powerful engine was available in sort of every man's car. Now Henry Ford was he was very much a worker oriented um, industrialist. He, he. One of his core beliefs, I think, was that he believed that his workers not only should they be paid well, but they should be able to afford the products that he made, the products that they made. And and he did pay his workers enough, and and they could afford. You know, he wanted he wanted his workers to drive Fords rather than some other brand. And I think he saw his workers, his factory employees, as one of his big markets that he wanted to have and to drive Fords. 
and you know that so they could afford you know the model t the model a everything was kind of affordable for somebody on a you know a, a factory worker salary and so the v8 came along and what made it revolutionary was that it was kind of a powerful engine that every man could afford and as, consequently they made a million of them millions millions of them and they caught on with the hot rodders and that's kind of what the mystique and the popularity with the flathead is that and it's kind of a bulletproof engine um but what ended up making the flathead obsolete was the fact that it was a flathead and when i say flathead when you look at it physically the head is very thin it's maybe a couple inches thick if you look at a modern v motor that's got an overhead valve drivetrain or even an overhead cam drivetrain the heads are very thick because they contain the drivetrain well with the flathead the drivetrain was in the block and so to add that extra stuff to the block required a lot of empty space and empty space cast iron likes mass to be strong so space makes it a little weaker so you have to physically make the block larger and that was a characteristic of a flathead is the the, more, the higher displacement of the engine the the physically larger the block had to be and if you look at the 60 horse flathead it was a very small engine probably could fit on this stand right here maybe about that big just really small that was why it's popular with midget racers and then you'll go all the way up to the 337 i think that the 60 horse was 136 cubic inches maybe um and you go all up to the 337 and it was 850 pounds and they could only use it in the big trucks and, and the bigger Lincolns. Um, and so <clears throat> this kind of speaks to that. This is, these are kind of hard to find, the 60, the 60 thousandths oversize um, pistons. Now these are, these are from the 85 horsepower version. The 90 horsepower version came along and had a domed piston and four, used four piston rings. Um, and that's a pretty common upgrade. Um, but the problem is you go any higher than 60 and you start you start interfering with the with the integrity of the block uh so that's why you know they would they would sleeve it or or um uh you know re-sleeve the block or whatever in that before they got to this point so this but a 60 thousandths it'll work you know these were official ford parts but anyway that's interesting um that's an interesting piece to be seen in there they're not you know they're not worth worth much individually and this is for the the 85 horsepower 221 which is not that popular of an engine to build but people do sell I, I do sell these so you know I'll hang on to that and when I run into some more like it I'll throw them with it hopefully I can get a set of eight uh, let's see what else we got in here tube uh, miscellaneous parts again this is these look like yeah these look like they're service parts okay this is a spark plug wire um, single spark plug wires uh, stuff like that again I think I mentioned in another video that those things don't really sell well on their own distributor base gasket connector now this might be this one's a D1FZ <clears throat> ah these are well, the rubber is actually still good that's the thing about older rubber is it's generally if it's natural rubber it's it, it's oftentimes it's still good as far as seals go b8a okay that's a, a seal for a flathead something or other but um, seals generally don't sell well on their own there's more um, <clears throat> had some of those in the last one insulator I think uh, I never did figure out what these were I just kind of stuck them in a lot some electrical part um, D4AZ 12A199C. Um, not sure what that is. Some sort of a controller, <clears throat> uh, computer controller. I'm not sure. It's potted, whatever it is. Uh, that one I will definitely look up because uh, electronic parts like that can be very hard to find, especially for classic cars, even though it is a 74. Um, 81 I think this is the same thing yeah same part uh, oops uh, see that's what happens to labels that just popped right off of there 
It's printed on the flap, fortunately, but I'll stick that inside and make sure that it doesn't get lost. Uh, hmm. <clears throat> Distributor breaker assembly, also for a flathead. Um, yeah, by this time, this is uh, 1950. <clears throat> um, you know, Chrysler introduced the Hemi V8, I think, in 1952, and it was... I want to say 200 horsepower, um, and and you know the best flathead that Ford had in 1952 was the 255. Well, actually, with the 337, which was useless for any but anything but a couple of very specific applications. But the 255 <clears throat> was in the Mercury's, and the 255 was essentially a stroke 239. It had I think a, you know, another quarter inch or half inch of stroke which gave it the other the additional cubic inches and I think 15 more horsepower. So it had 125 horsepower. Um, <clears throat> so Ford was kinda you know at that point they they had no choice uh, but to but then they probably had already been in development. I mean you know they're they're pretty astute people so they would have probably figured this out. But 1953, they came out with the 239 Y-Block, which was their first, the Y-Block was Ford's first overhead valve V8 engine. And just as a contrast, um, it was 239 cubic inches. So it was two-thirds the size of the 337, uh, and it was, it was less than half the weight. I think it was 400 or 425 pounds. Um, and it produced exactly the same amount of horsepower. So that's the difference that you get with, with, the, with the, the flathead, with the valve train and everything in the block. Um, you, when you go to an overhead valve, you don't have that overhead in the, in the block. You don't have all that extra cast iron that you need to, to, um, to make it work. So I'm going to um, I'm gonna put that off to the side. That's, that's a good flathead part. That should be useful. Um, hmm. Well, interesting looking bulb, but it's broken, so I'm just going to throw that away. Okay, suppressor assembly. Uh, okay, that's a... I think that's what those are. It's a, like a radio signal suppressor. Uh, probably a resistor or an insulator type of uh, plug wire to keep uh, radio interference to a minimum. That's kind of my guess. Um, these are in there. Those might be worth something if I can figure out what they are. There's no bags or anything to go with them. Um, here's more wiring. Um, this wiring can be worth looking up. This is a bearing. I have no idea what this is. This might be a distributor, p distributor part, perhaps. Um... Yeah, it's a, it's a small part. C5AZ and it'll be 65. Um, I'll look those up. They might be worth something because I've got uh, I've got at least four of them here. Um, ah, there's another starter spring. Uh, again, unfortunately. The part number has faded. It's barely, I can see there's something there, but it's really hard to see. Um, I might be able to figure that out. I kind of know what era it is. Those sometimes are worth some money. Uh, I think this is another one here. Oh, this is a starter drive assembly. Okay, this must have been packed about the same time as that other one. Um, Falcon. Or uh, C6VY, that's a um, Thunderbird, I think. Is it V? Um, I think so. I'm just, I'm just going off the top of my head here. I still have to look stuff up even after doing this for 10 years. Uh, this is a diaphragm. Okay, that's a, it's a vacuum diaphragm. I'm not sure. I have to look that up. Those are usually worth something. Um, rectifier. Uh, for 72 Torino, probably other applications. I'll look that up. That'll be worth something. Um, it's funny, there was that just a couple of flathead parts in the rest of it, 60s and 70s. Um, 
Okay, what else we got here? Uh, um, I can't read the. <clears throat> I can't read the. They look like piston pins, but they're not big enough. Uh, okay, that's a regulator assembly. That'll be worth looking up. Um, D9AZ, uh, part number indicates a 79. That's the same potted something. Those like those other two. No, I don't know what that is. I'll have to look that up. Uh, cap assembly. That is for a 83 F-150 Bronco. Um, yeah, you know, tune-up parts. I mean, you know, I might be able to get 10 bucks for it, but you got to ask yourself if it's worth it. There are a ton of small boxes in here. I'm just going to throw them all up. Ah, these are interesting. Okay. Oh, and they're full, too. Okay, so these are... <clears throat> oh, this is interesting. This is... These are John Deere. Um, and these are dealer dealer training literature. This one is... John Deere presents row crop utility tractors. And the other one is comfort and convenience features of John Deere's new generation of power. And what these are is they're film strips. And... They would have come with a little record, and I actually have the player over here that has a John Deere film strip in it um, and a record. And so I'm gonna hang on to these because I think the record is somewhere, uh, somewhere around. And probably another tote somewhere. They may be there, but but each one of these would have had a record, and 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 it was an integrated film strip and record player. Uh, so these are pretty cool. Um, you know, I don't know if there's a market for them, but historical wise, they're they're kind of cool. So I'll just I'll set those off to the side and hang on to them and see what else pops up. Okay. <laughs> Dad's root beer. I uh, don't think bottles are worth much, but you know. Okay. Some more stuff. This is just a pile of stuff here. Broken light bulb. I'll try not to cut myself. Uh, I'll just throw that. Whoa, no, that's a fuse. <laughs> when I bought my first house in Memphis 20 years ago, um, it had 60 amp service. So I had, had a fuse box with four of these in it. And I called the elect. One of the first things I did was call the electrician to uh, have it upgraded to. Uh, 200 amp service and uh, he said boy I'm glad you called me when you did and he showed me where the guy that had owned the house previously had, had evidently had problems with fuses blowing so he jammed a bunch of 20 amp fuses in all the in the four compartments so yeah I haven't seen these in years so I'll just throw that away uh, let's see okay here's another starter drive for a 68 um, 68 Thunderbird maybe, maybe other other years as well um, those are probably not gonna be worth anything these hold downs of some kind but they don't have part numbers on them um, same thing with this no part number um, insulator Brushes, brush set, alternator rotor bearing assembly. That's got to be, that's sealed, but I bet that's one of these two might be the same. Um, I'll look those up. That's an unusual enough part that that may be worth looking up. Uh, there's another one. Okay. So this one. No, I don't think so. Well, that might be different. Uh, 
you know, it's slightly different. I would not call that the same part, but you can see what I say about what I say about the boxes is they just fall apart after a while. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the part numbers faded on that one. Um, mm, D nine A B replacement electrical switch assembly. <clears throat> uh, those are worth looking up. Uh, that's an empty box. Clamp bolt, battery clamp bolt. Uh, I'll bet that's these battery clamps. So uh, those are worth looking up. Um, there's another package of those insulators. Most of this stuff. Oh, there we go. There's a there's a headlight bezel. Um, depending on what that's for. Mm. Um, there's no part number on it, but this is pretty distinctive. It's easily, you can just peruse eBay and you should be able to figure out what it is. This has got nothing in it. Empty box, whatever it was. Here is a, a cap. John Deere presents manure handling equipment. <laughs> um, it's a sending unit. Um, probably coolant temperature sending unit uh, looks like it's been used switch assembly I just throw that in a lot there's another one ah starter drive spring I think I saw one of these before but this is a this is for a model a um, that's and that may actually be where's that other one this one here I don't think so. It might not be the same. Yeah, it's got the same number of coils. It's a little bit bigger, though. Okay, <clears throat> so that's for a Model A, and, and I can tell that by the part number. Um, it has a prefix A. Um, in, 19, in the 1940s, eBay started, uh, not eBay, Ford started their prefix. Before the 1940s, uh, um, they pretty much had a one or two um, digit prefix on their part numbers but they were getting a little more complicated by that time so they started with the first letter so you see something like this where's one of these others <clears throat> so like you have an E3 TZ they went to the four pretty much universally in the 50s and so this first letter is a designation for the decade so they started with a in the 1940s and B so when you see a B that's 1950s um, this is just the model um, and so that's a model a starter spring I don't know if it's worth anything um, but I'll look it up I had another one from the previous uh, previous tote also um, there is a Nineteen twenty two to nineteen twenty eight to nineteen fifty three. A clutch, uh, it's hard to read. Clutch bearing. Um, looks like this is, is that the same? Nope, that is a little different. So that probably does not. Uh, yeah, you know, it's one of those things that's probably not worth anything by itself. If I had 20 of them, I'd put them up. Um, let's see what else we got. Brush set, that'll go up in a lot, lot. Ah, here's some more of these things. Okay, yeah, that's what those were. Um, there's another box of those. Uh, they might be worth looking up. I don't know if they'll be worth anything. Alternator, rotor bearing assembly. Okay, there's an empty box. Um, it's one of these. I don't know which one, so I'll just put those off to the side. Brush set. Uh, it's like a plug, frost plug maybe. Um, insulator. Uh, that might be worth looking up. Uh, it's somewhat unusual part. Alternator brushes, <clears throat> um, that stuff I'm going to put up in a lot by itself. Um, so 
so I'm going to grab a box. And then I'll just throw all this stuff in there and I'll keep filling that up until the box is full. Um, and this stuff. Those are. I'll put those in there too. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw these bearings in there because I don't. I know they're not gonna be worth. <clears throat> bearings just don't. Bearings don't really sell no matter what they are. They're easy enough to get a hold of. Um, okay, so we've got a couple more boxes here. Oil pump for a 144 or 170 six cylinder. Um, not a popular engine again. Um, okay, here's more brakes. More brake shoes. Just two brake shoes, probably. Uh, yeah, Bendix. That'll be a set. That'll be going off in a separate lot. I'll probably I'll look this up, but I'm not holding up much hope that that's worth anything. It's just not a popular engine. Okay, now we've got a bunch of manuals um, uh, the problem with these is they're in horrible condition um, even the ones that are not I mean this one would be good a 58 Thunderbird shop manual but it's missing you know who knows what it's missing off the back um, well there's the back cover right there um, yeah, I mentioned I was saving uh, saving some of these in the other room um, for because they're multiple volume sets, and I was hoping to get you know some more of the volumes uh, to go with it and make complete sets. This is interesting. This is a shop equipment catalog. <clears throat> you know, I mentioned that before. Uh, you know these catalogs are good sources of information so it might be that um, you know it might be somebody's looking for a catalog because they, they need that particular catalog so those are worth looking up to see what's going on um, 59 Ford Thunderbird shop manual that's not in great condition but you know I'll put it up for auction with 99 cents um, you know somebody will somebody will bite on it I'm sure uh, who knows what that came from um, Ford passenger car and truck special service tools. Um, well, most people don't know this, but Ford had a whole separate business of special service tools that really they only sold to their dealers. And I, I would assume other shops could buy them. Um, but that's not something the consumer would see. Uh, 54 Ford truck tandem axle shop manual. Uh, that's a pretty specialized thing. Um, I don't know. I don't see that fetching a lot of money. Uh, Ford Service Handbook. This would be a good, you know, lot. There's another K.R. Wilson catalog. That's pretty cool. Special Service Tools. Um, that's interesting. Um, authorized. Here's a Ford Lincoln Mercury Authorized Service Tools. Manzel's. I've not seen one of those before. Okay, two more boxes. What do we got? I'll throw these off to the side. Oh, gee. Wow, that's one giant brake shoe. <laughs> Man. Uh, that's going to be for a big truck. Let me see. <clears throat> B6Q. Uh, yeah, so... The Q in the prefix, this indicates 1956 Q, which is the big truck, and it says right here it's a rear brake shoe for an F700 to F750. Um, or also for the TH or WH7 or 750, uh, 60 to 64. <clears throat> um, these are basically completely unsellable. Um, Nobody, they're a curiosity. Be a great thing to put on the shelf just to go, you know, haha, what's that? It's a giant clown brake shoe. <laughs> but yeah, really, I mean, 
like there's a there's not a thundering herd uh, to restore seventies galaxies. Uh, there's almost uh, there's even fewer people restoring fifties trucks, like cab overs and stuff. Um, I'm sure there's their enthusiasts, but I just don't see them. Um, this is, I think this is a mirror. Uh, it's a West Coast style mirror, uh, or a part thereof. Okay, yeah, there it is. Um, I had one of these a little bit ago that just had didn't have the mirror on it. <clears throat> uh, but this is the kind of mirror that would stick out from the fenders. Um, it would stick out from the fenders and mounted to the side, mounted to the door. You see them a lot on delivery vans and stuff. Um, they're they're fairly popular, especially these period correct um, ones in good shape like this. So this probably I'll probably ask 100, 125 for it. Um, you have to be real careful packing them though, because there's no packing around that mirror, and they do. I have seen them broken um, pretty easily. So. Um, and just a couple more small things in here. There is another. John Deere presents the new 237 corn picker. And there it is. It looks like it's not in the best of shape. Uh, I don't know if these are nitro cellulose or not. <laughs> Should I light one on fire and see? Uh, let's see. Um, that's another sending unit. I'm gonna put that in the lot with everything else. I'm pretty sure that's not gonna sell either. Uh, E4TZ, uh, some sort of control module, switch, assembly. Um, so I got a few things here I'm gonna look up and uh, I'll probably put um, links in the description to the listings on my store website and also eBay for auctions. But with that, that is the end of tote number seven.